We promised you an ugly but delicious fish. And I think you will agree that monkfish delivers on that. Uh, monkfish are also known as goosefish or anglerfish. And they live on the seafloor, typically on sand, mud, and shell habitats. And they bury themselves in sediment to disguise themselves so that they can ambush their prey. Um, and they can change the color of their body to blend in with colors of the environment. And before we get started talking about how we catch monkfish, I thought I would share this little video, um, which is from an underwater camera from the Nautilus Live of a monkfish swimming. And they oops, turn off the audio on that. Um, so they have, they swim unlike any other fish. They sort of look like they're wagging their tail and I don't think they go particularly fast, um, but they're, they're definitely unique looking. Uh, they've got these sort of, pectoral fins that sort of flare out like wings in the back um, and a long tail. And the part that you're eating is that tail. Um, that's really the, the most edible part of it. But we'll we'll hear more about that from uh, Captain John Auer. <laughs> so Captain John Auer is here with us. He is a longtime fisherman um, here in Chatham. And I'm gonna have him start by telling a, you all a little bit about his life on the water and maybe a notable story about monkfish um good evening everybody uh glad to be here um for those of you who don't know me i'm john hour um second generation i've been fishing for about 45 years growing up we used to catch monkfish and throw them over the side because they really didn't have any value people just didn't eat them they were considered a trash fish and i really don't know when it took off but it was during the 80s the fish really started to become valuable at the dock for all boats, especially the draggers, because they were very good at catching them because they, monkfish do live on hard bottom, but primarily broken bottom or mud bottom because of the depth. And uh, I just remember when I was growing up, Julia Child, she made the monkfish very famous. She, um, she was the one that really put it out there, I think. She was the one that was big on trash fish, like whiting, but the monkfish, I'll never forget, I saw her video and it really helped the fleet and all of a sudden the, the price got very good for monkfish and uh we started bringing them in in the 80s and we started targeting them in the 80s in the fall the monkfish livers particularly around christmas right through the new year would be high as 15 20 dollars a pound for the monkfish Did you say and, livers? Uh, excuse me for the livers Liver. and just People the like livers yeah, and for those who don't know, they would make a liver pate, and then they'd also let their liver ferment, and they would take the oil of the liver and warm it as a liquid shot, and they would drink it during the holiday season, but I never tried that. I have tried the <laughs> liver pate. It's okay, but um, there was a time there the, the, val the value of the liver was worth more than the tail, believe it or not, but it was only during the holiday seasons. And then that kind of fell apart, unfortunately. It's kind of like the price of bluefin tuna. There's still a market for it, but it's only worth about four or five dollars for a certain time of the year, especially holidays. And then the monkfish market in the 90s and the early 2000s was extremely strong in New England. We were getting as high as $2.30, $2.40 a pound for the whole fish. And the only problem with that is when the value goes up of a fish like that, more and more people jump into those fisheries and it kind of tanked the market. And the price of monkfish now is about a dollar thirty for the large hole, which is nine pounds and up. And anything nine pounds and under right now for the whole fish is worth, I think they're about a dollar ten to ninety cents for anything under that. And then right now for the Gilnet Fleet and Chatham, that is the only fishery they can really participate in this time of the year. And there's only three or four boats doing it now. I've gotten out of the fishery because I'm getting older and you had to go a hundred miles this time of the year, and the weather is never any good. And it was like a shake and bake. You just, it just, you couldn't sleep. The bunk rides and stuff was just terrible. But there's still some guys doing it. It's, they're doing quite well. But the, like I said, the amount of boats that are doing it now has, has dropped off dramatically, except for the draggers out of New Bedford, Gloucester, and Boston and stuff. They target monkfish quite heavily. And it's a stock that's very robust. It's in terrific shape. And I don't really see National Marine Fisheries thinks the Southern stock, which the Chatham fleet participates in this time of year, it's dwindled a little bit, they say, but I just think they have the numbers wrong because it's been basing on the amount of boats that are fishing and there's way less boats 
targeting monk fish than they used to be. Yeah, that's an important point, John. So for the next few years, you might actually see less monkfish available in the market um, because the, the managers have set the amount that they're allowed to catch lower than usual. And that, that amount that they're allowed to catch each year is based on a rolling average of the last three years worth of landings. Well, the last three years worth of landings include two years of COVID where there was a, a low demand for seafood. And in some instances, they wouldn't even let the, they wouldn't even buy the fish, right? The processing plant right. shut down. And so you've, you've artificially deflated the amount of fish that you think are in the ocean because you're using these numbers from COVID. Um, and we were, we were able to, John Papalardo, our CEO at the council table was able to phase in some of those cuts as a result of that bad math. <laughs> um, and so they'll, they'll feel the a little bit less, but unfortunately we've got to weather through it. Um, hopefully in the next year or two, we can get them to change how they do that science. Uh, but it's a, it's a long road to get them to change their models. Yes, there's, there's plenty of oh, plenty of monkfish in the ocean. Yes. There's <laughs> more monkfish now than ever, I think, in a long time. Yeah. So, well, we will um, be back to John to talk about how he catches or he used to catch monkfish. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce Chef Tyler from the Rail. I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome. All right. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. We have a nice monkfish here. Okay, so this is actually the uh, the bottom of the fish. And this is the top. This is your spine here. So this is actually where the head is. Um, as was mentioned, the head is the biggest part of this fish. Uh, so we have really just the tail. And that's all we want. Um, so I'm going to cut off just this protruding spine here. And then we'll ditch these organs. These are the kidneys, I believe. I'm sure... John can clarify that for us. And take the boning knife, just snap down through there. Take that off. Trim out these organs here. Like so. Got a loose bone here. I'm gonna take that out real quick. And uh, then we wanna skin the fish. So the monkfish has a regular skin and then it also has a really thick membrane here, this silver skin. So we're just going to try to peel the skin back and it usually lets you right in and you can just take your hand and put it in between the membranes here and peel most of it right off. It's a little bit easier than using the knife for some people. It looks and like you when you're taking just grab the skin hold. off a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> if you grab hold, this is nice and meaty right here. You can grab that and then you just pull the skin all the way down to the tail. Lose the fins there. And then once you get down to the tail, I need to take the tail off anyway. So I'm just gonna come back to my boning knife. This is all bone and cartilage right here. I'm just gonna cut that right off. And now it's skinned, but we still have to take off the silver skin here. So it's very similar to uh, like a tenderloin, a, a beef tenderloin or a pork tenderloin more commonly. It has this membrane called a silver skin and it's really, really tough and stringy. And if you cook the meat with it on, it's really hard to work with, so. And if you start at the tail end here, let me flip around here. You can kind of just see how that peeled off right there. And if you're lucky, you can get both fillets in one piece or two pieces, I suppose. One per fillet, that's what I'm trying to say. It's nice and slimy. And then when you get to the end, just cutting it off just like that. And then we'll switch sides, come to the other side here. Doing the same thing. I'm just kind of tugging at the tail base until something starts to give. And then once it's loosened up a bit, just pulling, getting these fins out of the way. Pulling it all the way up, trying to not rip it. Because once it's split, it's really hard to go back in and get the other pieces. All right. Oops. Now I'm going to take these shears here and cut fins out. So that would be the uh, dorsal fin there. And then coming down here, this fin as well. Good. And then I'm just gonna clean the fish up a bit so it's a little bit easier to work with. 
I'm going to lose a lot of the ancillary flesh, I guess. I, I mostly just want the fillets here. So this would all be great scraps for stews, something else. But for the piccata, I want some nice medallions here. And then we're really aiming for this, this nice white color here. So anything that's kind of dark, odds are it's part of that membrane that we don't want. So we're just going to trim it all up, make it look nice. Flip over again. Same thing on this side. Anything gray we want to get rid of. All right, that's pretty good. Take that off too. Now, I'm gonna take the boning knife and I'm gonna come just a couple inches in, right about here, just to the side of the spine. You can feel the spine here. It's a nice bony ridge. And I'm just gonna put the knife into one side of it and then I'm gonna chop down and then I'm gonna pull out for the neck. So this is what we're after, this meat right here. That's what we want. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. Just come just to the side of the spine here and then peel out. And now, if you put it on its side, you can see the spine is here and we're just gonna take the fillet knife now and we're gonna work our way down the spine towards the tail, just with a nice gentle rocking motion. I'm gonna keep hold of the loin here and I'm just gonna kind of saw back and forth. I'm not pushing downward because I don't wanna go into the spine or else you'll end up with like flakes of bone in your fillet. Just nice and easy and there we go. A nice fillet there. And then flip it over. So now the spine is touching the board here. And I'm going to do the same thing on this side. All right. Now we got our two fillets. And then the spine is great for a stock. If you like chipino or bouillabaisse, a chowder, even any kind of fish stock that works for. And I'm going to take one of these fillets and turn it into our medallions here. So starting at the tail end, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna cut at a slight angle at first because this piece is really flat. So there we go, like so. And then I'm gonna work my way up. And that's the size that I'm looking for for the piccata. I don't want it to take too long to cook and I wanna be able to fit quite a few of them in there. Try to keep them as uniform as I can, slicing at an angle. Just try to make the pieces a little bit longer once we get towards the tip. And there we go. Now we have some medallions to make the piccata. All right, there we go. Go back to you guys. Fantastic, thank you, chef. First, we're gonna bring Captain John Hour back. Um, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about where they fish for monkfish. So one of the things you mentioned earlier, John, was, um, that you had to go 100 miles offshore. Yes, correct. Um, the guys would leave Howitch like they did last night. They left at four in the afternoon. Hopefully they get down there about 4 a.m., 5 a.m. this morning and start hauling. Usually takes about an hour and a half to haul one string. The nets have been sitting for four or five nights and they use anywhere from 11 inch to 12 inch mesh because gill nets sometimes get a bad reputation, but it's a very selective fishery. And by the mesh size, it determines the, the size of the fish they're targeting. And with monkfish, the bigger the fish, the more money they make because they would really like to get the nine pounds and up. They do have a trip limit. I currently don't know what the trip limit is per day at sea, but I think it's around, I think it's- uh, uh, 1,600 pounds of tail weight and 4,600 pounds of whole. Of whole weight, but they do bring them in whole, but they want to catch the larger fish because they get more money for them. And how and big can they get? What's that? How big can they get? I've heard of 72 pounds. Matt Linnell got a 72 pound fish one year down there. And that's the biggest one I've heard of. I did hear of one in the 80s, but I didn't know if it was true. But I did see the one Matt Linnell got. It was the biggest damn thing I've ever seen. It, it looked prehistoric. It really did. I think and, uh, in general, they're supposed to be able to get between three and four and a half feet, um, yeah. is what I've read. Um, and so you see here on the image that we're sharing, they're all the way down here where that little picture of the monkfish is. Um, and I've got some video here from some of the guys that are out fishing. 
um, that should help John give you a visual for what John is explaining in terms of what the gears like and how they fish for them. The gillnets sit on the bottom of the ocean floor and the fish swims into it. The smaller fish escape due to the mesh size. But like I said, the, the larger mesh, like this one here, that's probably a 10 or 12 pound monkfish coming around the machine. And the guys will sometimes give them a slight whack on the head with the hammer to knock them out because they try to bite you. If you put your hand anywhere near them and you put your hand inside their mouth, which I have done numerous times, they shred your fingers. Their teeth are designed to tear. They tear their fish. And they're very sharp and they have hundreds, probably thousands in their mouth. It's one of the sharp, it's other than a catfish, it's the one thing you don't want to get bit by. And I've had them actually clamped down on my hand and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and so anyway, the, the guys will call all day and clean out the gear and they steam home all night. And it's a, it's a very profitable, very lucrative fishery for the, for the New England ground fish gillnet fleet because the fish is still worth quite a bit of money. And, um, like I said, I really wasn't sure about the trip limit for this current year, but we we did very well on it, especially in the early 2000s down in Southern New England when the price was high and the, f the fleet was relatively younger then. And the guys, we, we all would go, we'd leave the dock about the same time and we'd all come home the same time because when you're a hundred miles offshore, you need some friends in case somebody would break down. I got towed home one time and I've towed guys home from down there because it is a long ways from home in a 42 foot boat. And, uh, the guys that are doing it, they're still doing quite well at it. But like I said, a lot of us, myself, I'm working at a boat yard for the winter and then we'll start back in the summer. But for the guys that are doing it, it's, it's very profitable right now. Yep. This one um, shows something that, that I don't think a lot of us think about uh, on a fishing vessel, but that there's a lot of rope coiling involved. You guys are fishing in like 600 feet of water, right? Uh, you, fish, you fish down there anywhere from 65 fathom all the way down to 120 fathom of water, which is a lot. And you usually go two to one or three to one on your rope. And quite honestly, sometimes it takes 15 to 20 minutes just to haul your end up with the machine and stuff before you even see a net to start picking the fish out of the gear. It's quite deep down there. And that's where we start. You always start, it's, I always refer to it like we start off in Florida and then we move back towards Chatham because the fish go down the hill in the winter time for the warmer water, then they work their way back up in the spring. When the water gets warm, they come back to the north or closer to land, we'll call it. And then um, by the time we finish up, we can see Nantucket at the end of the, you know, the end of the spring where we're targeting monkfish. They migrate south in the winter and they push north in the, in the I mean, excuse me, they migrate south in the winter and they push back to the north in the summer. They go from the deep water in the, in the, in the spring and they move right up. And we have them on crab ledge in the summer. We don't get vast numbers on the crab ledge. We still do quite well. I think my biggest day this fall was 4,000 pounds one day, but they, when they start to migrate, they're, they're like a school of ants. They all march at once. And then if they don't go, very few will move. And then next, you know, they, it's like a colony. They all get up and they move again. And as crazy as this sounds, especially in the spring, when we have the, the lunia phase, they come up off the bottom and they actually come to the surface. A lot of them will come to the surface and just mill around and they grab these little tiny birds. Mel will tell you what type of a bird it is. I don't remember. They yeah. like little, what are they? I don't remember either. Stephanie uh, might know. So anyway, you'll be, you'll be cleaning the entrails out of the fish and you'll find birds inside of them. It's the craziest damn thing you've ever seen, but they come up and they swim around and they go up and they go down. They, they've tagged them. I've, I've done a tagging study with them. And I know they have caught them in the way, they tagged the fish in the way part of the Northern Gulf of Maine and they caught it, caught it down off Virginia. And we've tagged some fish down in, the, down in the canyons where we go and they've caught them on Georges and they go to the Gulf of Maine. They just, they get up on what they call the thermal clines of water and they just let them carry them along and then they settle down again. Yeah. And some of the fish, and some of the fish just stay stationary. They've had them where they get up and they swim around a little bit and they go back down. They, they just hang around and they have other ones that'll travel hundreds of miles. So every, every creature is a little different, I guess. Absolutely. And this particular video, I think, is of a, a research set-aside trip. You normally wouldn't have this many monkfish on your boat coming home, right? <laughs> but during a, our, what they call an RSA, the government lets you lease unlimited amounts of monkfish to catch. You pay a price per pound. And it's very valuable to the guys that can do those trips. They can, 
I've caught up, I've been on RSA days, but they call them research set asides. And I've caught up to, I think we had 16,000 pounds in one day and one trip. And if you allow to do that, you put more gear in the water and you just keep hauling and hauling and you can bring them all in. And that's been a very lucrative, that's a big trip. And they, the guys really love those. And they make a lot of money when they do it. But unfortunately, that's just not often enough. But for this year, I think it is more often because there's less boats. Absolutely. So and they're, they're bringing back, um, they're, they're expanding the RSA program, I think, for the next year because they realize that they need to do some research, more research on the monkfish. Correct. Um, we, we learned during the most recent stock assessment that they're still not confident that they can age them correctly in an Correct. fashion. So they really don't know how big that four foot long But they grow fish quite, is. all I know is that when I was doing the study with a woman in, in Woods Hole, we did a study for a year and they grow very rapid. They grow fast. They're, they're very fast growing fish. I think, I'm probably gonna be wrong, but I think a 10 pound fish I think it's within five years, it can be up to 10 pounds, I believe, or something like that. It was not very long. They grow, they're one of the fastest growing fish in the ocean. Yeah. And there were, I can't say for the last couple of years, but about 10 years ago, it was the most valuable fish in the New England ground fish fishery, monk fish being landed yeah. at the time. In 2021, um, it was in just Massachusetts, we had $7 million with the landings. I don't have it for the entire region off the top of my uh, head, but I can look that up while we're going through the cooking demo. And, and get well, back when there was it. about 40 of us gill netting, 40 individual boats in Gloucester and stuff to go down and do the Southern New England one in the spring, in the early winter spring, I know then it was the most valuable fishery in New England at the time. For We were at least five or six years. It was the number one value of participation for money returned back to the boat. Nice. Um, must have been tied with scallop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, coming back to those those research set aside days, I did want to mention that it's a really unique program in New England that both for scallop and monkfish, um, what the government does is they set aside a portion of the catch, they allow the fishermen to essentially buy days or buy quota um, to access that additional monkfish and scallop, and the, the, all of that money goes to fund the research projects, um, which is a... Uh, right interesting model um, that we're hoping to replicate in some other fisheries in the future. You're correct. Um, all right. I'm, we, we can probably, the two of us can probably keep talking forever about monkfish, but why don't we let the audience uh, let, uh, unmute themselves if they have any questions uh, for John here before we get to the cooking. I have a question. Yeah, I know, I know the answer, but just, I think it's always interesting to hear what else that people catch when you're, I know that our monk fishermen catch some other things that they're allowed to land and someone had stopped by to pick up their package earlier and we we're chatting about the sustainability and skates came up. So John, could you talk a little bit um, about what else you might see when you catch monk fish and what else you can land? Um, we we use the same gear to catch skate as we do the monkfish. And the mesh size, we do go down an inch when we're targeting skate. We prefer the 11 inch mesh because it, it targets skate much better. And there's really not a lot of, especially in Southern New England, there's very little bycatch down there. We catch, um, once in a while, somebody will get a grouper, a few tile fish occasionally, but not very often. It's a very relatively clean fishery down there. And then off of Chatham, when we're using the skate nets, and we're catching monkfish in the fall also. We do catch lobster. Occasionally we'll catch a giant codfish because of the mesh size or a large hay, but and a few Jonah crabs and things of such. But we really, with that size mesh, most fisheries, most fish in the New England ground fishery, except for the monkfish and the skate, will swim through that mesh. And the only other skate that we do catch, we do catch barn door skates, which is a much larger skate. Um, you can, we, I think probably in the last five or six years, we we're able to start landing those again. There was a time that fishery was overfished completely. There was a time that barn door skate was more valuable than caught in New England at one time. And that's why the fishery was, uh, was completely wiped out. The fishermen just worked on barn door skate at one time. And, um, people thought at a time when we were tub trawling, they would catch large skates and they would consider them a barn door skate, but that was not the case. Then we finally started seeing the barn door skate. It's a much 
larger skate is probably three to four times larger than a winter skate, which is what we target. And it's gray and gray and a little light black on its belly and in dark on the top. It kind of looks like a somewhat of a leopard skin at times on their on their top side. And they have a long tail. They're harmless, but they get very big. And um, before we could start landing them, they were a nuisance for us. We were telling the government there was tremendous amounts of barn door skates in the, in the gillnet fishery, especially in southern New England. We had trips where we would throw over 10,000 pounds of barn door skate and we couldn't bring them in. And then the government started letting us bring in 500 pounds. I honestly don't know what the limit is right now for them, but there is a, there is a market for it. And it used to be the preferred skate. And once you lose a market though, it's hard to tap back into it. You lose, you know, the avenues of being able to sell it. But that fishery is picked up too. For the guys in Southern New England, they are able to bring in the barn to escape. But for the bycatch fisheries, there's really not a lot in it, you know, especially in the Southern New England. You can get through the gear pretty hurriedly, except for the amount of monkfish you're gonna catch, or if you do get into some winter skate. I have a quick question. Um, this is for Chef. Um, so when you were pulling off this, this more, the silver skin and stuff, um, obviously it's a pretty substantial fish, but, um, and you said that you can really get a pretty good grip on the body, but you, how do you protect the, the, the integrity of the flesh and stuff? Yeah. So, um, the first part is, like I said, trying to get it all off in one piece, because once you rip it, it is, it is a lot harder to get the rest off. Um, luckily with monkfish, the, the flesh is rather dense. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about marking it up. Even if you score the sides, uh, the, the fish is going to hold. So, um, I wouldn't worry about it falling apart. For instance, even if you make the outside look really messy, the fish will still maintain its shape and we're also going to be dredging it in flour. So that'll give it some added structural integrity, if you will. Uh, so go crazy. Don't, don't worry about messing up the fish. Just try to get as much of that stuff off as you can when um, I don't have the fillet in front of me anymore, but if, whenever you can, if you can pinch the, the silver skin off and then you can get the knife underneath that, that's what you want to be doing. So it is a little tricky and the, the thinner the swath you're taking off, the harder it is because you have to do it over and over again. Uh, so if you can get it all off at once, it's a lot better. Right. But and, then one follow, and then one follow on, um, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, for the household, uh, when you go out for retail purchasing, you know, on the Cape locally, what, um, at what point are you generally getting your retail fish prepped? I mean, what it's, it's you probably skinned. Do you oh, know? Yeah, yeah. I'd imagine you can get the loin just like that. Um, okay. it pre skins exactly what mine looked like at the end. You can probably buy a piece of fish just like that. No bones, no skin, no membrane. All right, it's just about six o'clock. Are you guys hungry? I'm gonna walk you through what I have in front of me here. This should be everything that came in your bag. Those are some nice orange bags. Um, here I have a little bit of cooking oil that you're providing. Uh, I have some kosher salt here, any salt will do. Um, minced shallots and garlic here, a uh, stick of butter. This is the herbs here, pre-chopped, um, thyme, oregano, and tarragon. Uh, here we have some capers, some fresh squeezed lemon juice, and then I have some white wine to deglaze the pan, uh, a little bit of flour here, and then I have my fish medallions. So before I get started, I'm just going to turn on my pan. We want that nice and hot by the time we get cooking. So I'm just going to let it preheat a little bit and we'll get started. I'm going to start by taking the fish and I'm going to salt it just a little bit. Anytime I use flour, I like to hit a little bit of salt first. If you don't care for quite as much salt as I do, you certainly don't have to do that. We will be salting the dish. And then I'm just going to put my fish right in here. So this is called dredging. We're going to coat the surface area of the fish. It's going to do a few things. One, it's going to protect the fish from drying out. It's going to help it cook a little bit more evenly because we're coating it. And then the flour is also going to act as a thickener. So our sauce will end up a bit thicker, almost like making a gravy. So I'm just going to put it back on the sizzle pan here. Then I'm going to grab some oil, go in the pan. And you want to make sure that it's nice and hot. I'm using about two or three ounces here. 
I'm going to go for a little bit more actually, because the flour is also going to absorb some of the oil. So once we're nice and hot, we'll start sauteing. In the back here, I have a pot of water just to reheat my pasta. I have it pre-cooked here. If you folks cooking at home, you might just be cooking it to order. That's fine too. If you look closely at the oil when you're heating a pan, eventually it'll start to what's called shimmer, where uh, it'll actually create its own little convection current inside the oil, and you'll be able to see it moving around a little bit. So we should be just getting there. Really important when you're taking your fish, you want to shake off any excess flour. So that's why I used the basket over there. If you put too much flour in, it's gonna the flour is actually going to shake off and stick to the pan, and then you're going to burn the flour uh, before your, cook, your fish is fully cooked, and we want to avoid that if we can. So I'm going to start putting it in. And you can start to hear it sizzle right away. That's what we're looking for. I could have even used a little bit more heat, but we want to get the show moving. And I'm going to spread the medallions out as much as I can. We don't want to crowd them because we want them to have ample surface area to evaporate the moisture or else we'll be boiling the fish instead of frying it. And that's not what we want. So we're going to let it cook for maybe 90 seconds, two minutes on each side. You'll start to see the color creep up the bottom of the fish. When we get a nice light golden brown on the bottom, then it'll be time to flip. The hotter your pan is when it starts out, the faster this part goes. Usually in the restaurant, we actually keep a stack of pans hot on a burner ready to go. So we can skip this step a little bit. The more you move the fish, the more flour you're going to see at the bottom here. It's okay. Just kind of scrape it up with your tongs. Keep it moving. If it sticks, it's going to burn faster. Let's check one out. So we're not quite browning, so we're going to go for a little bit longer. finding the hottest spot on that burner there. All right, I'm gonna start flipping here. That's what we're looking for is this color over here. But now I flipped it, I can't touch it too much. So we're just going to let it cook for a few seconds. And then the next things we're going to be adding to the pan will be the garlic, the shallots, and the herbs. So if you can see here, we're starting to brown that flour. Browning is a chemical process that adds a lot more flavor to the dish. For specific recipes, you might not want to brown, but generally browning adds flavor. So it's usually a good thing. All right, I'm going to start to add the onions here, the garlic and the shallots. Shallots usually take a little bit longer to burn, so you generally want to add those first. Garlic burns much faster, so we add that second. Good little pinch there. And then the herbs. So the fish is going to keep cooking. We're mostly watching the garlic. If the garlic starts to burn, we've got to deglaze the pan pretty quickly. For now, we'll just give that a shake and let it keep cooking. I'm going to flip this big nugget over here. Tyler, say a word about deglazing. Um, yeah, so deglazing is breaking down the fond. So all that browning that I was talking about here, it's, we call it a fond. It's a French term. And so when we add liquids to the pan, all of that is going to come up. It's not going to stay stuck on the bottom of the pan. It's going to emulsify into the liquid. So I have some white wine here. And I don't need quite this much, but I like to have plenty handy. So give it a good splash. 
you might get a little flambe. That's when the fire comes off. Most cooking wines aren't too heavy proof. You shouldn't have to worry about that too much. And then you can take your tongs and just kind of scrape around or a wooden spoon, whatever you're using. Try to scrape up as much of that fond as you can. And you'll notice that the wine will start to turn that color, a, a little brownish, a little yellowy. We want all that flavor to come up into the sauce. And then we got some capers here. Sprinkle those in. I don't like to add the capers directly into the oil uh, because it, it intensifies the flavor of the capers. And I love the nice briny flavor, but you don't want to go overboard with it. And then we have some lemon juice here. This was the juice of a whole lemon. I don't need quite that much. Maybe just an ounce or so for this portion here. And then we want to taste it. So I have a little tasting spoon here. You can use your finger if you're comfortable with that. Just don't brain yourself. It's like home. So I want to taste it to make sure that Number one, the alcohol is cooked off. And then I want to taste the salinity. Uh, the capers add a lot of salinity and I did salt the fish before, but that's kind of uh, captured inside the flour. So not much of that's reaching the pan. So now I'm going to take some salt and just put a little sprinkle in there. And then salt to taste. If you like it really salty, go crazy. However much you like. It should taste pretty salty. It should taste strong, salty, lemony. You should taste the brine from the capers as well. And now we're just sort of letting the sauce reduce a little and you should be able to notice that it's thickening. Not only is the wine reducing, uh, but also the flour is activating and, it, and it's becoming more like a gravy. We don't wanna thicken it too much. We are gonna add a whole bunch of butter at the end. And we're almost to where we wanna do the butter. You want to reduce about halfway from what you started with. And the more heat you have, the better, the faster this all takes place. If you're, if you're not cooking on high heat, you're going to end up overcooking the fish by the time the alcohol evaporates. So yeah, you're basically bringing it to a boil. There we go. And now let's get some butter. So your recipes are quoted for two. I'm just cooking for one here. So I'm using about three ounces of butter, maybe a little bit more. That can be to taste too. If you wanna use a little bit less butter, that's totally fine. A little bit more butter. You don't wanna add so much that it's gonna break. So if you can see, now that the butter's in, the sauce is starting to thicken up a little bit more and you wanna keep the pan moving as the butter melts. If you just put the butter in there and leave it alone, it might separate out and you don't want that. You want the whole sauce to stay nice and emulsified, nice and thick. And now we'll just give our pasta a quick flash. Like I said, it is pre-cooked. So I'm just gonna dump it in this basket here. Give it just a few seconds to warm up. We got a nice plate here. And then if you want to shift all your protein to one side of the plate, you can kind of drip the sauce that way and we'll put the pasta right there. That's like a good portion. And then just twirl your tongs, maybe give it a couple tosses. All right, come over to your plate here. Pasta in. A nice twirl, make it stand up. And then you can just spoon your fish right over. A little bit of the reserved herbs for garnish. And there you go. You make it look it so is. easy. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I hope so. <laughs> Hopefully everybody uh, kept up with you on that one. Um, I see some folks are cooking in real time with you in their kitchens. Um, and others I think are, are watching intently and taking notes and we'll probably go cook after we wrap things up here this evening. <laughs> so chef, tell us a little bit about 
the best way to store monkfish if you're not quite if you you, you bought it and maybe you you meant to cook it and you you had to leave it in the fridge for a day or two or any tips or tricks on that for us? Sure. Um, fish wants to stay dry, at least in my experience, uh, when you have moisture, basically with all foods, it either wants to be submerged in water or it wants to be totally dry. So uh, the best thing to do would be to have um, a container that's big enough for the fish to lay flat all by itself and uh, line the bottom of that with paper towels. Make sure that the fish is dry when you put it in. You can pat it dry uh, or even wrap it in, uh, you know, like butcher paper. If you have some handy, that's that's why they use it is because it keeps it dry for the most part. And then just lay it in there, cover it and, you know, don't make sure that it's airtight. And that's it. It should last for at least a few days that way. Uh, it is fish. It's, it's not like it's going to last for two weeks. Right. It's, it's always enough. better fresh. <laughs> yes. It's my first time ever cooking monkfish, so I'm very excited to try it. Yeah. Yeah, all right. You've got a hot, a hot dish, so enjoy. <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you very much. This is great. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.